back to physics class. Physics was trying to go through. Today we have Adam Becker, <coughs> a uh, highly popular uh, novelist, uh, written a popular, important book. Adam uh, did his uh, bachelor's degree at Cornell in physics, went to the University of Michigan where he did a PhD in physics. Then he did the most important act, which is to not work in academic physics. <laughs> he decided to become a science writer by finding connections and making his way. He's been a science writer for six or seven years. Um, he uh, has published this book, which he's going to show you. But I bought this book, and uh, it's very good. You should all buy this book. Okay. You look at a picture of Nils Bohr's house in there. It's like a castle. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he's going to tell us now uh, the trouble with quantum physics and why it matters. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you for having me here uh, at uh, KU. It's a real pleasure to be here and talk with you for the department colloquium today. Um, Without any further ado, let's uh, talk about the trouble with quantum physics and why it matters. Uh, well, actually, first, can everybody hear me OK? OK, good. Um, oh, wonderful. My computer turned off. Um, yeah. Oops. Oops. Yes, that's the trouble with quantum physics and why it matters. It turns our computers off. Um, anyway, quantum physics works. I think we all know this. Uh, it works phenomenally well. It explains an enormous variety of phenomena to an incredible degree of accuracy. You know, it explains why I'm not passing through the floor right now. It explains why the sun shines and why I can see that the sun shines. You know, it explains uh, the nuclear hearts of the most distant space probes. It helps us build all of the technology that's being used to present and record this talk right now. Uh, it powers. Uh, you know, our medical imaging scanners and the lasers in the supermarket checkout scanner. Uh, quantum physics certainly works. But there's a problem. Uh, quantum physics works, but there's something funny about it. It's certainly strange, but the strangeness of quantum physics, that's not a problem. The world is a wild and woolly place. There's plenty of room for strangeness. The problem is that it's not totally clear how the theory lines up with the everyday world that we see around us. And uh, that's reflected in the mathematics of the theory itself. Uh, so here's the Schrodinger equation, right? And uh, we use that to describe how quantum states evolve when nobody's looking at them. And uh, you know, those quantum states evolve smoothly. They don't jump around. There's just you know, smooth undulation from one state to another. This is why we call this uh, a wave equation, right? Waves, wave. Uh, but then there's the Born rule, right? That's the lower equation. Uh, and that's different. Uh, it's, uh, it says that when we look at quantum states, they jump. They, uh, they pick an eigenstate of the basis that we're measuring them in. And uh, as you may have noticed, these two equations they're not the same. Which leads us to the question, when do we use one of these instead of the other? Now, the usual answer to this question is, well, we use the Schrodinger equation when we're not making a measurement, and then we use the Born rule when we are, which is true as far as it goes. But what's a measurement? Is a measurement just when I look? In which case, why am I talking about quantum mechanics with all of you when it only applies to me? Uh, is it just when humans look? Uh, well, you know, we, we seem to think that quantum mechanics was probably true even before there were humans around. Uh, you know, we, we don't like to think that the wave function of the universe was waiting billions and billions of years for someone to come along, like a paramecium or maybe a better qualified observer, like someone with a PhD. That's not how we think the universe works. So what's a measurement? Well, that's not entirely clear. And so this gets a special name, the measurement problem. You know, when we're not looking before wave function collapse, the wave function is, you know, spread out. And then when we look, we find a particle in a particular spot, and the wave function instantly goes to zero everywhere else. Now, it's tempting to say that this is about probability. 
which is you know, what we usually do when we talk about this. But if it is about probability, it can't be about probability in sort of a straightforward, normal way. What is it the probability of? Well, the wave function, we usually say, is the probability of finding a particle in a particular state. Fine. That's fine. But wave functions perform some tricks that we don't think of normal probabilities as being able to do. So for example, wave functions can interfere with themselves and diffract. These are not things that we think of probabilities as being able to do. So we can't just say it's probability. There has to be something a little bit more going on there. There has to be more to the story. And there's also the problem of, OK, what's going on before we look? When we look, we find particle in a particular state. What was going on before we looked? Well, usually before we look, objects are in superpositions of states. What is a superposition? What does it mean for something to be in a superposition? Why don't we ever see things in superpositions? Uh, and this leads us to the best known problem associated with the measurement problem, Schrodinger's cat. Right? We've all seen this before. You've got the slightly radioactive metal hooked up to the radiation detector. And if the radiation detector measures some radiation coming off of the metal, then it will smash the vial of cyanide and kill the cat that is sealed inside of the box. Now, if you seal all this up inside the box and then you wait the right amount of time, then quantum mechanics says that the radioactive metal will be in a superposition of both having emitted radiation and not having emitted radiation, which means that that superposition will get entangled with the rest of what's in the box. And you will end up with a box with its interior in a superposition of cat dead and vile smashed and cat alive and vile intact. Now what happens when you open the box? Will you either see a dead cat or a living cat? Do you really think that if you open the box and see a living cat, that the cat was not alive the moment before you opened the box? This is what Erwin Schrodinger asked when he first posed this puzzle in 1935. Schrodinger was not trying to, uh, he was not trying to show the strangeness of quantum mechanics as a beautiful feature of the theory. He was trying to show that this was a problem. It was a bug, not a feature. Schrodinger's cat, uh, said Schrodinger, showed that there was a serious problem with our understanding of the theory. Not that it was wrong, just that it was incomplete. There was something missing from the theory itself. But Schrodinger's contemporaries, by and large, they didn't agree. Uh, here's, uh, here's Niels Bohr, here's Werner Heisenberg in the 1930s. Uh, they just didn't agree with Schrodinger at all. They denied exactly the point that he was making, that you could talk about the cat being alive or dead before you open the box. Some of them said, oh, it's uh, meaningless to talk about what happens before you open the box. Because before you open the box, you can't see what's happening in principle. And so that means it's meaningless to talk about it, because it's in principle unobservable. Other people said, no, it's the act of opening the box that forces the cat to be dead or alive. And other people said, you know, Erwin, you're worrying about what the world is like. Physics isn't about what the world is like. Physics is just about issuing predictions about the outcomes of experiments. That's all that physics does. And this set of vaguely related and questionably coherent claims eventually came to be known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, the standard way that we talk about these things. Don't ask what's happening when you're not looking. You can't talk about what's happening when you're not looking. Um, and eventually, a slogan came to be associated with the Copenhagen interpretation, shut up and calculate. Now, there are some virtues to this, right? Remember, quantum physics works incredibly well, right? There are some reasons why we might want to shut up and calculate, uh, because it lets us get on with the work of actually calculating uh, outcomes in quantum mechanics, and that lets us do a lot of really, really interesting science, right? Um, but there are a few problems. One problem is that uh, if we really say that quantum physics has nothing to do with 
the world around us is just like a black box, an instrument where we turn the crank and it issues predictions, then the explanatory power of quantum physics is pretty much zero. Because it's not related to the world. It's just a black box. It's just an instrument. So it doesn't explain anything. It just tells us how things will be. Uh, second, the fact that the theory works as well as it does would be a phenomenal miracle if it were completely unrelated to the stuff of the world. If the theory just accidentally gives us phenomenally accurate predictions over and over and over again, it stands to reason that there must be some connection between the mathematical structure of the theory and the stuff in the world. Uh, and yet, we don't know what that is. Uh, another problem, of course, is that this isn't how we think about any of our other physical theories, right? We don't talk about Maxwell's laws this way. We think that there are electric and magnetic fields, and that they are things that are out in the world, and Maxwell's laws tell us how those fields behave. Uh, you know, this is, this is a strange way for us to be thinking about one of our best theories about the world. Uh, and finally, you know, if you really insist on saying, no, measurement is essential to quantum mechanics, there has to be a system that is the measuring device and a system that is not, that is the, ob the observed system, then uh, have fun doing cosmology, where you want to talk about the entire universe all at once. So that's not going to go too well for you. Now, this is the part of the talk where I have to give a couple of warnings. The first warning, which is the warning I don't need to give any of you, but I give when I uh, give this talk to the public, uh, is that, you know, of course, this is not the standard way that we talk about quantum mechanics. I'm giving you a sort of minority or dissenting view. Um, but I'm still pretty confident in that dissenting view. And part of it is that, you know, a lot of people have thought about quantum mechanics for many decades. A lot of philosophers have done a lot of good work in the foundations of quantum physics. A lot of physicists have done good work in the foundations of quantum physics. And that makes me feel pretty confident in the view that I'm giving you, which is, compared to the views of some of those people, fairly conservative. Um, part of the reason why I feel confident in this is also due to the work of many historians of physics who have really put the lie to some of the standard stories that we tell about the history of quantum physics itself. Um, and that leads me to the second warning, which is the best psychology research says that if you want to debunk a myth, you shouldn't start by repeating the myth. I'm going to ignore that research. I'm going to rehearse the myth that we all know about the history of quantum physics first, and then I'm going to tell you what really happened. So I'm going to signpost this as best I can. Um, so first, here's what didn't happen. Here's the myth. Once upon a time, there were a group of brilliant physicists in the first quarter of the 20th century who worked together to come up with one of the ultimate achievements of the human intellect, quantum physics. These physicists included Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, whose back is to the camera because I couldn't find a picture of the three of them together where he had his face to the camera. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those three, uh, many others, Paul Dirac, uh, Max Born, uh, uh, Max Planck, uh, and perhaps most famously of all, Albert Einstein. Um, now Einstein had been a bomb throwing revolutionary in his youth, but by the time quantum physics came along, he was elderly and not at the height of his powers anymore. And uh, he simply couldn't accept the randomness that appeared to be inherent in this new theory that he was partly responsible for. He could not accept that the universe could be anything other than deterministic. He said, God does not play dice. He knew that this theory had to be wrong deep in his bones. And so in an attempt to show that it was wrong, he put together a series of thought experiments that, uh, that were meant to show that the uncertainty principle, uh, a core part of the theory itself, had to be inconsistent, that there were experimental ways around it. Uh, so he kept proposing these thought experiments, and then Bohr and company would knock them down and show that Einstein was wrong. And this culminated in a particularly embarrassing episode in 1930, where 
Einstein tried to get around the energy time uncertainty relationship with a uh, 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 Rube Goldberg contraption with a, a box hanging from a spring scale with a little door in it that would let out a particular photon of light at a particular time with a specified energy uh, and a clock hanging off of the box. And then Bohr showed that this ingenious scheme failed because Einstein had not taken his own theory of general relativity into account when coming up with this thought experiment. And so, slinking away in the deepest humiliation, Einstein finally came up with one last thought experiment which he thought would really end this quantum charade uh, called the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen thought experiment, which he said showed that there was spooky action at a distance in quantum mechanics. Bohr replied to this and said, no, there isn't. and um, and, or, or rather, Bohr replied to this and said, no, there's not a problem here. Einstein is wrong and quantum physics is fine. And that's how it stayed for a long time until both men were dead. It was thought to be a philosophical point of little interest until one day a brilliant physicist named John Bell came along and showed that no, it was a matter of experiment. You could show whether or not Einstein was right. And Bell set out what you would have to do to do that, the experiments were done, and quantum mechanics was right, Bohr was right, Einstein was wrong, and the world was finally safe for quantum mechanics, and everybody lived happily ever after. So, first of all, raise your hand if you've heard something that sounds a lot like that before. Yeah, okay, so, how much of it is true? Well, some, uh, one or two things about it are true, but not a whole lot. Uh, it is certainly true that there was a brilliant team of scientists who, working both individually and collectively, came up with what we now call quantum physics in the first three decades of the 20th century. It is true that among them numbered Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg and Wolfgang Pauli. It is also true that at the time that the first full theories of quantum mechanics were showing up in 1925 or 1926. Uh, Einstein looked like this. Uh, he, was, he was in his mid-40s. He was not elderly. He was not senile. He was not having problems thinking clearly. Uh, quite the opposite. It's also true that uh, Einstein had problems with quantum physics, but it is not true that his primary problem with quantum physics was the randomness of the theory. He didn't like that. He wasn't thrilled about it, but his letters and writings at the time make it very, very clear that he had two primary concerns about the theory. He was concerned about locality, and he was concerned about realism. He wanted to be sure that things were there whether or not we look at them, and he wanted to know that things in one place can't instantly affect things in some other place. He felt that these were two fundamental principles upon which all of science were based. His concerns about randomness were secondary at best. He made it very, very clear that these were his problems. And indeed, these were the things that were at stake when Einstein came up with his series of thought experiments. Almost none of them were meant to go after any sort of uncertainty principles. They were instead meant to demonstrate that quantum mechanics had a problem with locality. And indeed, that's what this thought experiment was meant to show. Uh, this is a diagram based on a sketch made by Niels Bohr, and it is incomplete. Einstein's original thought experiment here included a mirror a light year away. And it is unclear if there was a spring scale or a clock involved. Um, and this was actually a very early form of the EPR thought experiment. It had to do with locality. It had nothing to do with the energy time uncertainty relationship. So Bohr completely misunderstood this and many other thought experiments. And it actually gets worse for Bohr because even if Bohr was right about, even if he had been right about what Einstein was trying to get at here, which Letters from Einstein and Ehrenfest at the time make it very clear that this was nothing to do with the energy time uncertainty relationship. But even if it was, Bohr's reply, and let me just lay this out for you, Bohr's reply was, Einstein, your attack 
on the internal consistency of quantum mechanics is wrong because it violates general relativity, a theory that we still don't know how to make work with quantum physics. So his reply to the thought experiment that Einstein wasn't making was completely inadequate. There is actually a way around this thought experiment that Bohr thought Einstein was making that works entirely within quantum mechanics, but Bohr did not provide that. So this should have been a massive humiliation for Niels Bohr, but instead uh, Einstein simply felt like, okay, he's still not getting it, let me try again. So here's Einstein and Bohr talking at Ehrenfest's house in the 1930s. Einstein goes back and works with his colleagues, Podolsky and Rosen, and comes up with the EPR thought experiment, which, yes, is about spooky action at a distance, but specifically says, look, you have a forced choice here. One of two things has to be true. Either the universe is non-local, there's instantaneous action at a distance, or quantum physics is incomplete. There are features of the universe that quantum physics does not fully represent. This was what Einstein was trying to get at with the EPR paper. It's very clear if you read that paper and even more clear if you read Einstein's later writings on the subject, especially in uh, his 1949 Festschrift. Um, Bohr's reply to EPR was, um, I'm going to call it not clear. Um, Bohr himself actually later apologized for what he called the infelicity of expression in his reply to EPR, but um, he then didn't go on to explain what it is that he was trying to say in EPR, or in his reply to EPR. It is um, a very, very strange document. Um, among other things, that reply that Bohr gave for a long time, the best place to get it was in a, uh, a book edited by Wheeler and Zurek called Quantum Theory and Measurement. Um, that book came out in the early 80s, and for about 10 years, two pages in Bohr's reply, which was only four pages long, were swapped, and nobody noticed for 10 years. So that tells you something about the intelligibility of the writing of the great physicist Niels Bohr. Um, in any event, uh, many people were still convinced that Bohr had to be right and Einstein had to be wrong. Part of the reason was that, you know, Einstein wasn't proposing an alternative or a completion to quantum physics. Part of the reason was that Niels Bohr had a tremendous, you know, group of people who had worked with him, whereas Einstein sort of went through his professional life mostly alone. But part of the reason was also due to a theorem from John von Neumann that showed up in his famous quantum physics textbook of 1932. Uh, in that book, von Neumann presents a theorem that he says shows that the fundamentally statistical nature of the quantum state cannot be avoided. There's no way to further complete the theory without just replacing the theory with an entirely new one. And people took this at face value. There were a few people that questioned it. Um, the first person to find that there was a serious problem with it was the mathematician and philosopher Greta Hermann, who is a student of Emmy Noether. Uh, she found a problem with von Neumann's uh, uh, theorem in 1935, just a few years later, but very few people listened to her. In all likelihood, at least part of that problem was, uh, or part of the reason that very few people listened to her was because she was a woman uh, at a time when women were still generally not allowed to teach at universities. Um, but by and large, people thought that von Neumann was right, which, you know, He's John von Neumann. It's, it's pretty reasonable to assume that he's right. He was usually right, but in this case, he was wrong. And uh, he was shown quite dramatically to be wrong uh, by David Bohm in the 1950s. Now, Bohm came up with an entirely new interpretation of the same theory of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. He found a way to add extra variables, hidden variables to the system, such that particles have definite positions at all times under all circumstances while still uh, being mathematically identical to regular non-relativistic quantum mechanics in all of its experimental outcomes. So for example, uh, the way he does this, 
is essentially, he says, that every particle has associated with it a pilot wave. Um, and that wave guides the motion of the particle. And uh, so, for example, in the double slit experiment, the particle goes through one slit, but the wave goes through both, interferes with itself, and guides the particle to the correct position on the photographic plate leading to particle trajectories that look like this and give you an interference pattern that is built up one particle at a time. Now, whether or not this is correct, it certainly shows that von Neumann's theorem had a serious problem, but Bohm didn't do a very good job of identifying what that problem was in his paper, and Greta Hermann's work was still mostly unknown. It took another physicist who was inspired by Bohm's work to figure out exactly what was wrong with von Neumann's proof, and that was John Bell. John Bell hated the Copenhagen interpretation. He said it was rotten. Uh, he liked to reference Hamlet a lot when talking about the Copenhagen interpretation. Um, you know, hence the rottenness, right? Something rotten in the state of Denmark. Um, so Bell saw Bohm's papers in 1952 and he said he'd seen the impossible done. He immediately knew that von Neumann had to be wrong. The problem is he'd only heard about von Neumann's proof. He hadn't read it yet. He hadn't read it yet because von Neumann's proof at that time was only available in German. Bell didn't speak German. By the time von Neumann's book was published in English, Bell was busy with other things. But in 1964, uh, Bell finally found the time to sit down and take a look at von Neumann's theorem, see exactly where the problem was, and he published a paper explaining where the problem was, and that led him to another question, which is, uh, can you come up with a hidden variables theory of quantum mechanics that is local, that doesn't have weird, spooky action at a distance, because Bohm's theory certainly does. And that's where Bell came up with his famous theorem. He said, OK, EPR said that it was a choice between locality and completeness. But it's worse than that. We have a choice between locality and correctness. In other words, either the universe, uh, either quantum physics is, is, um, is inaccurate in some experimental situations, or the universe is non-local. In other words, Bell's theorem states that quantum mechanics is incompatible with locality. That's it. That's what the theorem says. Now, there's a little star there on incompatible. Why is there a little star there? Well, there are ways out of it, but they're very, very, very limited. One of the only ways out of the conclusion that quantum mechanics is incompatible with locality was actually proposed, though not as such, a few years earlier than Bell's theorem by this guy, Hugh Everett. He came up with the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. And it turns out that if this interpretation is correct, that gets you out of the non-locality because one of the implicit assumptions that goes into Bell's proof is that there are only single measurement outcomes of any particular variable when you do a measurement. But if every time you do a measurement, you get all possible outcomes, the theorem breaks. Um, yeah, this is, this is just a quick demonstration of how uh, uh, Everett's interpretation works. The basic idea is um, the entanglement that I was talking about between the radiation source and the other components in the Schrodinger's cat box that doesn't stop when you open the box. When you open the box, you get entangled with the superposition, and then everything else does too. And so suddenly, there are two of you. And the reason you don't feel like there are two of you is each one of you can only be in causal contact with one copy of the universe. You are separated from the other copies through decoherence. Um, I'm not saying that this is correct. I'm not a partisan of any particular interpretation. I'm just saying this is an option. So there are other viable options on the table. We don't have to just say shut up and calculate. There are other solutions. There are many more than just the two options I've proposed here. And in fact, both pilot wave theory and Everetti and many worlds theories, those are more like families of interpretations than singular interpretations themselves.
And uh, in this field of quantum foundations, there are also many open problems that still remain. Um, for the many worlds theory, there are problems related to how we get probability out of the theory. If, if you never have wave function collapse, then where does Born's rule come from? Because Born's rule is certainly correct. Uh, for pilot wave type theories, the question is, okay, this works for non-relativistic quantum mechanics. How do we get a relativistic extension? How do we get a quantum field theory out of this and do some particle physics? Um, but all of this may leave you with a different and much more difficult question than any of those. Who cares? Quantum physics works. Quantum field theory works. All of it works. It works incredibly well. So why does any of this matter? Why does it matter if there's a measurement problem? Why should we care about this? Well, that's a really good question. And uh, I'm going to need to give uh, someone much smarter than I am the opportunity to answer that question. Now, another thing that people often say is that for guessing, two identical theories, two theories, you suppose you have two theories, A and B, which look completely different psychologically, different ideas in them and so on, but that all the consequences that are computed all the consequences of the computed are exactly the same. They would say they even agree with experiments. The point is, though, that the two theories, although they sound different at the beginning, have all consequences the same. It's easy usually to prove that mathematically by doing a little mathematics ahead of time to show that the logic from this one and this one will always give corresponding consequences. Suppose we have two such theories, how are we going to decide which one is right? No way, not by science. Because they both agree with experiment to the same extent, there's no way to distinguish one from the other. So the two theories, although they have di deeply different ideas behind them, may be mathematically identical, and they usually people say that in science which you pay, one doesn't know how to distinguish them, and that's right. However, for psychological reasons, in order to get new theories, these two things are very far from equivalent, because one gives a man different ideas than the other. By putting the theory in a certain kind of framework, you get an idea of what to change, which would be something, for instance, in theory A that talks about something, but you say, I'll change that idea in here. But to, to find out what the corresponding thing is you're going to change in here may be very complicated. It may not be a simple idea. In other words, a simple change here makes maybe a very different theory than a simple change there. In other words, although they're identical before that change, there are certain ways of changing one which look natural which not look natural than the other. Therefore, psychologically, we must keep all those theories in our head. And every theoretical physicist that's any good knows six or seven different theoretical representations for exactly the same physics, and uh, knows that the two, that they're all equivalent, and that, that nobody is ever going to be able to decide which one is right at that level, but he keeps them in his head hoping that they're giving different ideas for guessing. Incidentally, that reminds me of another thing, and that is, that the philosophy or the ideas around the theory, uh, a lot of ideas, you say, I believe there are, there is a space-time or something like that in order to discuss your analysis, that these ideas change enormously when there are very tiny changes in the theory. In other words, for instance, Newton's ideas about space and time agree with experiment very well. But in order to get the correct motion of the orbit of Mercury, which was a tiny, tiny difference, the difference in the character of the theory with which you started was enormous. The reason is these are so simple and so perfect. They produce definite results. In order to get something that produces a little different result, it must be completely different. You can't make imperfections on a perfect thing and have another perfect thing. So the philosophical ideas between Newton's theory of gravitation and Einstein's theory of gravitation are enormous. The differences, rather, are enormous. What are these philosophies? These philosophies are really tricky ways to compute consequences quickly. A philosophy, which is sometimes called an understanding of the law, is simply a way that a person holds the laws in his mind so as to get quickly at consequences. Some people have said, and it's true, for instance, in the case of Maxwell's equations and other equations, never mind the philosophy, never mind anything of this kind, just get the equations. The problem is only to compute the answers so that they agree with experiment and it's not necessary to have a philosophy or argue or words about the equation. That's true in a sense, yes and no. It's good in the sense you maybe if you only get the equation, you're not prejudicing yourself and you'll guess better. On the other hand, maybe the philosophy helps you to guess. It's very hard to say.
For those people who insist, however, that the only thing that's important is that the theory agrees with experiment, I would like to make an imaginary discussion between a Mayan astronomer and his student. The Mayans were able to calculate with great precision, great precision the predictions, for example, for eclipses and the position of the moon in the sky, the position of Venus and so on. However, it was all done by arithmetic. You count a certain numbers, you subtract some numbers and so on. There was no discussion of what the moon was. There wasn't even a discussion of the idea that it went around. There was only calculate the time when there would be an eclipse or the time when it would rise, the full moon and when it would rise half moon and so on. Just calculate it only. Suppose that a young man went to the astronomer and said, I have an idea. Maybe those things are going around and there are balls of blocks out like rocks out there. We could calculate how they move in a completely different way and just calculate the, what time they appear in the sky. So, so the, of course the Mayan astronomer would say, yes. How accurate could you predict eclipses? He said, I haven't developed a thing very far. But we can calculate eclipses more accurately than you can with your model, and so you must not pay any attention to this because the mathematical scheme is better. And there's a very strong tendency of people to say against some idea. If someone comes up with an idea and says, let's suppose the world is this way, and you say to him, well, how would you get, what would you get to the answer for such and such a problem? And he says, I haven't developed it far enough. And you say, well, we have already developed much further, and we can get the answers very accurately. So it is a problem as to whether or not to worry about philosophies behind ideas. So Feynman was certainly wrong when he, uh, <laughs> he was certainly wrong about some things, including, uh, including his uh, apparently implicit assumption that only men can do physics. But, uh, but he was certainly right about the importance of the ideas behind our theories. Uh, they help us not just with our current work, but with coming up with the next theory that will go beyond the theories that we currently have. Because in addition to, I think, everyone in the room agreeing that quantum physics works, I also hope that everyone in the room can agree that quantum physics is not the last word. There will be another theory that goes beyond it. Whether we find it tomorrow, or 100 years from now, or 500 years from now, there will be another theory. Um, but these ideas also matter beyond the world of physics and the world of science. Remember, for, for uh, thousands of years, at least in Europe, uh, the standard picture of the universe had the sun at the center and the earth going around it. Um, and when Copernicus and others came along and uncentered the earth from the center of the universe, that made possible a great shift in the way that people thought once they were exposed to that idea. If he had not done that, it is hard to imagine that Charles Darwin could do what he did with uncentering humans from you know, the field of biology and, and the animals and plants and life in the world. And if Copernicus and company and Darwin and Russell and company had not done what they did, it is very, uh, sorry, Darwin and Wallace and company had not done what they did. Uh, it is very hard to imagine that Stanley Kubrick would have been able to do what he did. Uh, so these ideas do not just matter for physics or for science. The picture of the world that comes along with our science matters for the wider world beyond the scientific enterprise. Uh, now, there's a lot more to say about all of this, um, which is why I wrote a book about all of this. Um, it would be wonderful if you would buy the book. Um, but if you don't want to buy the book, they probably have it at the library. And if they don't, you could ask the library to get it. Um, but in any event, these are the sorts of questions that I go after in my book and the sorts of issues that I talk about. Uh, I hope that you found it interesting. Um, before I finish, I just want to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, who gave me a very generous grant to help work on this book, um, and the Sioux and Osage peoples whose land we occupy here in Lawrence. Uh, with that, any questions? Thank you. Yeah? Well, since the many worlds interpretation is an interpretation, yeah. and it's completely consistent with everything, mm -hmm. uh, what's 
What's the problem? Ah, uh, yeah. So, well, so there's a Except few. Except that our mind boggles, but that's <laughs> a problem with our minds, not with quantum mechanics. I certainly agree that uh, our mind boggling is not a legitimate problem that we can, you know, or charge that we can level at uh, the many worlds interpretation. That's not a problem at all. Um, there are a lot of people who say things like, oh, a multiverse can't be right. It's too much. There's too many things. Occam's razor. I think that's very silly. There is, however, a pretty reasonable category of objections to the many worlds interpretation, which, uh, before I go into that, I should say, I think that the many worlds interpretation is one of the strongest currently existing contenders for a good interpretation of quantum physics. So with that, I have a lot of sympathy with you. Um, but there is still this question of probability, because in the many worlds interpretation, uh, there is no wave function collapse. The Schrodinger equation is just sort of exactly true at all times, or you know, it's uh, relativistic extensions like the, the Dirac equation and, and the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, so those equations are, are just exactly true at all times, which leads to the question, OK, so if, if we have a deterministic theory, where does probability enter into it? Because it's certainly true that the predictions that quantum mechanics issues are of a probabilistic nature. Um, one proposed solution to this is to say, OK, well, in the many worlds interpretation, there are many copies of us. So we don't know where in that multiverse we are. And so the probability comes about as a result of self-locating uncertainty. We have to find ourselves in this infinite multiverse. So um, the two problems there are, first of all, OK, how do you put a probability measure on an infinite multiverse, which is a problem that we also run into in inflationary cosmology. Um, but the other problem is, is that really a, a legitimate move? Can you really say, OK, that's where the probability comes from? And that's a philosophical issue that um, you know, there are plenty of good philosophers and physicists who think that they have solved this problem, and they may well be right. But there are also other people who have said, no, there's still work that you need to do there. Um, so for example, one possible objection to the self-locating uncertainty thing, and I want to make it clear I'm not endorsing this objection. I'm just saying that it's an objection that someone has raised, uh, is, OK, but when you say I am one of these copies, and after a split occurs, I still persist in just being one of these copies, you are saying that there is something that is not obeying the Schrodinger equation that is you know, uh, uh, providing your a uh, continuous singular experience down one path of the branching. Um, and that sounds an awful lot like an immaterial soul, and I don't believe in immaterial souls, and so I find it hard to believe that self-locating uncertainty is the place where probability comes from in the many worlds interpretation. Now, I'm not endorsing that objection. I am just saying that that is an objection that people have which at least seems like something that someone should respond to, and, and people have. So this is an ongoing debate in the literature. Um, I will certainly say that I think, as I said, one of the strongest contenders, many worlds. Um, I, there are days when, I, when I'm sort of asking myself, why do I not believe in many worlds? And then there are other days where I think, no, that probability thing's a real problem, and one of these others looks better. Yeah? Is it incumbent upon the people to come up with these various ideas to also figure out how to test them? Well, so that's a good question. Um, I think that ultimately we should shoot for testability. And it's certainly true that there are solutions to the measurement problem that are testable, at least with current technology or you know, pretty easily envisioned future technology. So for example, there are theories that involve abs uh, like actual modifications to the Schrodinger equation that say, OK, Schrodinger equation applies most of the time. But there's also a little stochastic term that we're going to add so that every so often uh, wave functions basically get multiplied by a narrow Gaussian in position space. And, uh, and the frequency with which this occurs depends on the number of particles in the system in question. So you'll never see it if you're only looking at a handful of particles. But it'll happen basically all the time for anything that has an Avogadro's number of particles in it. Um, so that is the kind of thing that leads to experimentally different outcomes. And people have started testing it and putting bounds on the parameters in such collapse theories. Um, but for something like, say, the pilot wave interpretation versus the many worlds interpretation, 
Well, if I were feeling particularly uncharitable to the pilot wave interpretation, I'd say there isn't a relativistic generalization, so the entirety of particle physics can't be explained. But assuming that that problem can be solved, and there are people working on that, um, those two theories are completely identical um, for now. It may be that when we come up with a theory in the future, we find that it favors one or the other interpretation or some other interpretation, and that it is accessible to experiment. Um, so yes, it would be nice if we can distinguish between these things experimentally. The hope is that at some point in the future, we will be able to, and there are people working on that right now. For example, for all we know, when someone does come up with a relativistic extension of uh, pilot wave theory, it may lead to genuinely new predictions. We just don't know yet. Yeah. So uh, I'd like you to comment, what do you think about the, the device, which is almost universal in uh, the quantum mechanics literature, uh, of, uh, actually lying about the theory and uh, falsifying the content of physics in order to make the discussion more interesting and in order to dumb it down so that you don't think they have to go to school and learn it. And uh, of legit actually substituting false premises that are known by all experts or all who really studied it, and all concerned know those false premises are completely hogwash, and yet the people who are left out of it don't know. Uh, I'll use Bell's own theorem as an example. Uh, it, it poses a binary choice. Either you, uh, either your view of reality is this absolutely stupid, naive form of probability that he poses, or uh, you have to uh, deny the existence of realism. And the, the middle ground, which is I. I took a course in quantum mechanics. I'm not going to buy the absolutely stupid, primitive idea of particles and distributions that you pose for me. It seems to be what Einstein was trying to say. And, and so when Einstein said it's incomplete, he's saying people even haven't even started to discuss it correctly. Yeah. Well, in the presentation, my question for you is, what do you think of that technique of lying to people so that the message is more interesting and they can, they can uh, swallow it easier, and, uh, and postponing any real development of the theory as it stands. I mean, I definitely think that there are some inexcusably bad garblings and misunderstandings and you know, just flat out wrong presentations of Bell's theorem in almost any quantum mechanics textbook I care to think of. Um, and I, I do think. I think the only place where I disagree with you is, and I'm not sure if this is more charitable or less charitable, I don't think that these people are lying because lying involves intention. I think these people genuinely don't understand Bell's theorem. Um, I think that for cultural reasons, and this is something I talk about in the book at great length, uh, and it's something that Bell talked about himself quite a bit, um, the full consequences of Bell's theorem have been fairly difficult for a lot of physicists to swallow. Um, you know, Bell himself said repeatedly, I don't think that there's any way out. I think that you know, this means that you have to give up on locality if the experiments turn out the way that they have. Um, the one hope he held out for some sort of exception was the many worlds interpretation. And even on that, he was wobbly. Um, he didn't say it was a choice between you know, locality or realism or locality or hidden variables. He knew better than that. Um, and yet, I can't think of a single textbook. That's not true. I can think of a single textbook that represents this correctly. And that textbook is not an introductory textbook in quantum mechanics. It's an introductory textbook to quantum foundations. Um, so it's, huh? Oh, by um, uh, Norson came out. I think two years ago. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so th this is just, this is very hard to understand, um, you know, why this happened. Uh, it's possible that it's deliberate. I don't think it is. Um, uh, similarly, you know, uh, I, I've always been puzzled by, uh, 
the emphasis that some physics textbooks place on some other things like complementarity, the idea that, oh, you have these two contradictory pictures and they will give you incomplete, you, you, you have to use them together to get a complete picture of what's, no, no, there's nothing contradictory between a particle and a wave. You can have both. That's what Bohm said. Whether or not Bohm was right is immaterial because it shows that they're not contradictory. You can do both. It's not a problem. Uh, and if the many worlds interpretation is right, you can also explain everything with waves and no particles, or fields and no particles, as the case may be. So I, I find this very puzzling and, um, and unfortunate, but I, I'm also um, I'm fundamentally an optimist about this. I think you know, we are getting to a better place on this than we were a generation or two ago. And although the textbooks haven't really reflected it yet, uh, you know, these days I can give a talk like this and not get, you know, driven out of town, right? Uh, which I think would not have been true a while back. Yeah? If you were teaching quantum mechanics, how much do you think it's appropriate to wade into quantum quantification? I think that it depends on the level of the quantum mechanics course. I think of that if it's an introductory course, I think it's important to bring this up at the beginning of the course and then check in with it every so often throughout the course, but to spend most of the time saying, look, here's the math and here's how you solve it. Because I think you really need to understand how to solve Schrodinger's equation and see the consequences before you can get a full appreciation for why these questions are so weird. Because if someone said to me, hey, uh, I have this black box theory that says that there's a law of nature which is intermittently suspended and replaced with a different one when I look at things, I would say, OK, so you're nuts. And why should I believe you? <laughs> but if you make me go through solving the hydrogen atom first, then maybe I'll believe you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not saying that you know, that's how we should do things. But I, but I do think that this is something that we should foreground very early on. Because there are, I, I also think that there are a lot of students who go into these courses and ask questions like, what's happening when we're not looking, get unsatisfactory answers, and assume, oh, I must be too stupid to understand what's going on here. And that discouragement will sort of ride with them. And either it will drive them out of the field, or will drive them into some sort of denial about what's going on in the theory. <laughs> Um, so I think it's important to foreground it. I don't think it needs a lot of time in early courses, especially in, in you know, in a world where most courses don't talk about this at all, it'd be a disservice to students to give them a wildly different course that leaves them with, you know, the inability to do things that, you know, other students at the same level at different universities can do. But I think as you get to higher level courses, you can spend more time talking about this. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Anybody? Anybody who's not faculty? <laughs> okay, well, thank you, uh, and I'll be around afterward. <laughs>